Thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Town of Reading's fourth annual Economic Development Summit. My name is Erin Schaefer, and I'm the Economic Development Director for the town. I'll be hosting this evening with our uh, with assistance from my colleague Jane Wellman, and it's my sincerest pleasure to welcome our speakers tonight. We have political economist Barry Bluestone, CEO and founder of Mansard Camille, uh, Commercial Real Estate and Brokerage Firm Jeremy Sirier and CEO and President of Reading Cooperative Bank, Julie Thurlow. We're looking forward to an evening of informative remarks, including key trends and insights about economic resiliency and withstanding this dynamic economy. We're also joined by our town manager, Bob Lillisher, and our Town of Reading Select Board Chair, Mark Doxer, who will be making introductory remarks tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge our community partners, RCTV. Tonight, we will kick off the evening with opening remarks, uh, followed by key, keynote speaker, Barry Bluestone, and our panelist presentations by Jeremy Sirier and Julie Thurlow. And we will then open uh, to the facilitated question answer discussion for attendees to ask questions of the panelists. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping points. I just wanted to let the public know that this webinar is being recorded and it's also being live streamed by RCTV. Attendees are muted and the chat and video functions are currently disabled for attendees. If you'd like to ask a question, and we hope you do, during the question and answer portion, attendees will be able to ask questions by using your raised hand function or uh, the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. If you are joining us by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand, and then you will be prompted by a voice on the phone uh, to press star six to unmute yourself. I will then, uh, I will, when we get to that portion, I will remind folks of how to be able to participate. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to our town manager, Bob Lillisher, for his opening remarks. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, when we started down the path of economic development, um, almost seven or eight years ago. Um, I didn't really know what to expect, but one of the things that um, I appreciate the most is a group I call Friends of Reading, and you'll hear three of them speaking tonight, um, Barry, Jeremy, and Julie. Um, the contacts we've made have been really helpful uh, in many ways, um, and really uh, it allows you to sort of travel outside of Reading. Um, that's not always easy uh, for local government. Um, Professor Bluestone, um, almost six years ago now, conducted uh, a famous EDSAP, uh, Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool, <clears throat> and um, he examined the strengths and weaknesses, uh, almost like SWOT analysis, strengths and weaknesses primarily. Some of them were uh, endemic to Reading just because of where we are and what we are, but some were things that the town uh, had some control over. And um, his, his insight was really very helpful. Um, we were able to not only learn what we had control over, but which things that we did have control over mattered. So there's no sense in spending a lot of time fixing something that really doesn't influence economic development. Um, we did several other studies along the way. The one I was involved with was particularly eye-opening. Um, I waded through a lot of mass DOR data um, with another employee. We visited uh, about 20 peer communities. And uh, one of the most startling things that I learned, uh, and this is about 2017, was of the 25 peer communities, Reading had the lowest average wage paid for jobs in the community. That was shocking to me. Um, and furthermore, not surprisingly, we were, uh, we were a specialist at exporting workers. Um, contrast that with Burlington. Um, Burlington was an importer of workers. And I'll never forget the comment I received from the Burlington town manager, what do you do for economic development? And he said, I answer the telephone. <laughs> so Reading had a different skills, a different opportunity set in front of us. And um, I'll be really interested to hear uh, all three of our speakers tonight. And I really thank them for coming and also for all of you. I know it's a, it's a busy time. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, select board chair, uh, Mark Doxer for some opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Aaron. Um, good evening, folks. My name is Mark Doxer. I'm the current chair of the Reading Select Board. I want to welcome you all 
uh, and offer my thanks for, for joining us to discuss economic, economic development for our town. Just to quickly acknowledge, I know my fellow board member, uh, Ann Landry, is also attending this evening and some other members may, may join. Um, quick shout out to Lisa Egan as well, <laughs> not of the board, but also participating. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think Reading has made a really good start working on downtown improvements, bringing together downtown businesses into a committee that hopefully will become a more formal organization, and encouraging downtown residential projects to include storefronts and hopefully even some restaurants and some other uh, retail activity. Supporting local businesses has really been a challenge in the world of Amazon um, and also other developments in neighboring towns. COVID-19 clearly has taken this challenge to a much higher and more difficult level. I see the challenge as first for survival, but very importantly also for thriving in the land of COVID and, and beyond that obviously as well. The select board is committed to addressing the challenge and keeping it very much front and center. This is one of the core goals uh, established for the town manager and town staff for this fiscal year and certainly going beyond that as well. The challenge of offering more downtown parking for shoppers is on our plate to address in the January timeframe. And looking at the potential of new spaces in town for both community activities, as well as the potential of opening up um, a large commercial space, perhaps around the RMLD and DPW sites, um, have been important parts of our discussions and things that we'll be bringing forward to town meeting for further exploration. I'm very excited by the summit, uh, excited by the great speakers that Aaron has brought uh, together to share with us tonight, and the potential to really encourage volunteers to help us in our mission. Please stay involved. Please let Aaron, town staff, select board know if you'd be interested in participating more with us. Thanks again for all your interest and engagement. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Barry Bluestone. Our keynote speaker, Barry Bluestone, is a political economist and professor emeritus of political economy after a 50 year career in higher education. He has served as a founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University. As a political economist, he has written widely in the areas of affordable housing, urban and regional economic development, income distribution, among many other topics. He also consults with civic organizations, community foundations, industry groups, housing developers, trade unions, and various federal, state, and local government agencies. As Bob mentioned, Barry prepared the economic development uh, self-assessment tool, the EDSAT, in 2013 and is obviously familiar with the uh, town of Reading economy. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Barry Bluestone for his keynote presentation. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Um, I'm um, glad to be back in Reading. Um, we had a wonderful time almost seven years ago when we did the first EDSAT. Um, the Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool, as I'll explain in just a few minutes, was something that we developed at the Dukakis Center at Northeastern. And in it, uh, during, its, uh, uh, during its period of time, we had over 115 towns and cities in Massachusetts, as well as about 30 in other states that took part in it. And from that, we learned a great deal about what makes economic development work. So what I'd like to do is very quickly uh, share my screen so you can take a look at um, what I've prepared for you today. And um, uh, looking back, as I say, at uh, Reading uh, from seven years ago. Um, as I said, in 2013, uh, the town of Reading asked the Dukakis Center to, uh, to conduct the economic development self-assessment. So today what I wanna do is look back at those results, but also look forward as to where Reading is today and uh, some of its strengths, as well as some of the challenges. Um, I did go back and I looked at uh, what we had seen at that time in terms of the number of establishments in Reading itself. Uh, in 2001, almost 600, uh, because of the decline in the economy as a result of the 2007-2008 recession, it fell to 572. And when we were actually in Reading doing the economic development self-assessment, it was back to 586. Employment similarly fell from about 7,300 to about 6,000, uh, but by 2013 was at a new record of about 7,500. Again, these are jobs in Reading, not the number of people in Reading who are at work. Uh, 
Let's take a look. However, I decided to take a look at some uh, Department of Labor statistics to see what has happened as a result of COVID. So you'll see, um, I looked at 2013, 2016, 2019, and then uh, February of 2020, just before COVID really hit hard. And you'll see that um, total employment in Reading had uh, grown very rapidly to about uh, 14,000, but by July 2020, it was down to 11,800. Um, if we look at um, the unemployment rate, you'll see the unemployment rate had fallen to just 2% uh, just before COVID hit. Uh, in a state which had some of the lowest unemployment rate, we were actually even below the state level. But of course, once COVID hit, we had 12.6% uh, or about one out of eight um, employees had lost their jobs as a result of COVID. So let's take a look at what uh, Reading looked like way back in the period we were studying it from 2001 to 2013. We're looking at the change in the number of establishments and try and keep this in your mind as I go ahead. Uh, across all industries, there'd been a loss in establishments, but there'd been a large increase in healthcare and social assistance in accommodation and food service, that's hotel, motel, food services, professional and technical service establishments had grown, arts, entertainment, and recreation. At the other end, we had lost construction establishments, real estate, uh, and administrative services. If we look at employment, overall employment was up 182 jobs between 01 and 13, uh, but uh, the bulk of that was in retail trade and accommodation and food services. Right there, about 1,600 new jobs with a net increase of only 182. We were losing jobs in construction, in manufacturing, uh, even in professional technical services. Remember that because we're gonna come back to that. So um, let's take a look at what EDSAT was all about way back when we were doing this in 2013. Uh, the economic development we found was a collaborative process, a process that builds on strong adaptive economies, but it requires good leadership. Companies move to municipalities, not states. We talk with literally hundreds of firms and, and companies that do site locations, and they said, you know, we'll come to Massachusetts, but then we're looking at Reading versus, let's say, Burlington. And municipal officials, therefore, play a critical role in playing up what's strong in your own city. We also have thought today, with federal deficits due to COVID-19 stimulus spending, uh, and even a call for tax cuts, there's gonna be little additional aid to local communities from the federal government and perhaps not from the state government. The result will be local economic development is on your own. And you have to find ways to attract business enterprise to your town in order to maintain your tax base and of course create jobs in, the, in Reading for the people who live there and elsewhere. Uh, we came up to the conclusion, again, you have to be the CEO for economic development. You have to begin by assessing your municipality's strengths and weaknesses, which we do with EDSAT, and then most importantly, change what you have control over and collaborate with others in the state, the federal government, over things you might be able to influence. But the proposition was that cities and towns have the ability to create their own destiny and they can benefit from having sophisticated partners in doing that. So as I said, under EDSAT, we started by surveying corporate real estate and development professionals. And out of that, we created a very large assessment tool, an electronic survey that Reading filled out in 2013. The goal, if you have some deal breakers and you do a, sell, a, a city self-assessment, you take appropriate city action, you can turn those deal breakers into deal makers. That was the whole idea behind EDSAT. What were some of the deal breakers that the business community told us about? Well, ignorance of changing market conditions, the importance of time to market, business moves at the speed of light. They can't wait forever to get uh, a permit that they might need. Um, the other thing is, is that uncorrected cognitive maps. We can think of towns and cities in Massachusetts, and if I just mention them, you probably have a cognitive map in your head about it. A Lawrence, a Lowell, a Lynn, on the other hand, a Newton, a Brookline. Where does Reading's cognitive map fit in? Too little attention to some site of deficiencies can hurt your chances. A slow municipal process can hurt. And uh, as we found out, too much reliance on tax breaks as a way to attract business. It doesn't work that well. 
So we had uh, in the survey categories, the permitting processes, things about labor, development and operating costs, the business environment, transportation and access, the quality of life and the social environment of the town. And uh, we therefore had 10 areas that we looked at everything from access to customers and markets, to the concentration of business services, accounting and legal services, the cost of land, labor, the municipal process itself, quality of life in the community, the quality of life on particular sites, business incentives, tax rates, and access to information about your town. So let's go back and see what we learned in 2013 based on the EDSAT that Reading completed. Well, lots of strengths. Very good highway access. Uh, compared with the what we call the comparison group municipalities, um, traffic in Reading is is basically comparable, but has regular access to a traffic engineer. Uh, it has capacity for growth and reliable service in terms of all its utilities. Uh, its mix of office space includes more class A and class B space than some of the comparable municipalities, indicating better overall quality office space. It has a much higher percentage of managerial and professional workers than other comparable towns and cities. Uh, more than half of Reading's available labor has earned at least a bachelor's degree. Uh, it has some public transit. It's attractive. Uh, its quality of office space is, is, is good. Uh, and it had some sites available for uh, development. Uh, predictable permits. Reading provides a development handbook to prospective developers. Uh, it allows for citizen participation in the, re in the review process but elected, elected officials have tried to expedite development by facilitating community group dialogues. It has cultural and recreational amenities that you know well. Crime was lower than in other towns and cities. Uh, the home ownership rate is higher and the local schools are very good, particularly um, in terms of uh, having their students uh, do well on things like MCAS. Uh, in terms of the local tax rate, um, a local meals tax to pay for local services, a flat tax rate that is 4% lower than others. Uh, commuter rail, proximity to universities and research. Um, the town manager has played a significant role in facilitating the permitting process, which we found out was very important. Has a very good website uh, that prospective uh, firms can take a look at. On the other hand, there were some weaknesses we found relative to other communities. Timeliness approval, site plan review, zoning variances, and the appeals process take an average of four weeks longer in Reading than the average for other comparable groups, uh, comparable towns. Uh, rents in Reading for all asset types and classes, uh, other than the cost for Class A office space is somewhat higher, Class B, Class C. Again, this is 2013. Um, a smaller proportion of Reading's available sites for retail and office sites have long-term on-site parking, something that I know you're trying to deal with now. Uh, Reading does not have a good, at the time, did not have a cross-market strategy where they, the town and business organizations and field organizations would all work together to kind of market Reading to the world. Um, Reading has very little land available at that time. Uh, including a low percentage of large parcels that could be used for industrial commercial. Uh, Reading does not have a checklist of permitting requirements for pers prospective developers, which other towns developed and developers like to see that. Um, but um, though the state has a lot of special tax incentives, uh, Reading does little to help firms take advantage of them. Other communities uh, have uh, leadership that helps uh, prospective employers uh, firms uh, access state uh, incentives. Uh, doesn't have tax increment financing, at least back in 2013. Uh, housing, relatively high cost relative to some of the other communities around there. A lower proportion of fast food restaurants, fine dining, daycare, again, compared with others. Um, it has not, back in 13, supported public private partnerships or adult education programs that may have changed since then. And um, at least way back in 2013, it didn't have a designated webmaster or staff person for maintaining its website. It doesn't have a vocational school within its jurisdiction, but has one close by. Um, so, but what really matters? So 
we looked at those 105 towns and cities and we ran a significant amount of statistical tests comparing um, on the one hand, how much employment growth did you have in that town? How much establishment growth did you have in that town? And what factors seem to contribute to more rapid economic development? Okay, and what we found uh, was the factors, and these are correlation coefficients, um, and this was done on 50 Massachusetts municipalities. And what were the factors most highly correlated with an increase in establishments? Interestingly, and I had no idea when I started this, what these would turn out to be, was simply economic development marketing had the highest correlation, about 0.37. Those communities that really worked hard at marketing themselves uh, to potential businesses did better in attracting establishments. Timeliness approvals had the second highest correlation. Those communities that had a process to uh, speed up the process for um, zoning, uh, you know, doing any kind of zoning changes that might needed or dealing with building codes did better in attracting uh, establishments. Having parking available on site was important. Public transit was important. Cross marketing between the business community and the town was important. Low traffic congestion turned out to be somewhat important. Fast track permitting, again, one of those things having to do with timelessness approvals and site availability. So, um, what actually stood out for Reading. Public transit, low traffic congestion, site availability. Where was Reading week back in 2001 to 2011 in attracting establishments? Didn't have a full scale economic development marketing plan yet. Its timeliness of approvals was slower than other comparable towns and cities. It lacked the kind of parking and it didn't have a strong cross marketing. So finally, how is Reading doing today? First of all, recall what were the key employment growth sectors between 2001 and 2013. Retail trade, hotels and motels and food service, healthcare and social assistance, other services excluding public administration, finance and insurance. Okay, now let's look at its progress since 2013, but of course before COVID-19. What have been the sectors that have the largest growth in employment? Well, computer systems design, architectural and engineering services, construction, leisure and hospitality, healthcare, and arts, entertainment, and recreation. That is a dramatic change from what was growing only seven, well, seven to 10 years ago. Um, in terms of those industries with greater than 100 employees, where have you seen rapid change? 48% growth in employment in arts, entertainment, and recreation. 38% growth in employment in credit agencies. A 34% increase in employment in Reading and construction. And then in healthcare, nursing homes, leisure and hospitality. So my point is that um, there has been only a modest increase in total employment between 2013 and 2020 between the time we did EdSat and today, but critically shifting from food and beverage stores, insurance carriers and finance agencies to what? Computer systems design, architectural and engineering services, construction, leisure and hospitality, and healthcare. This is all part of the broader American industrial transformation and Reading is taking uh, its share of those new sectors. Nearly a 50% increase in arts, entertainment, and recreation. More than a third, as I said, increase in employment and credit agencies. More than a third increase in construction. And at least one-fifth growth in ambulatory health care. But nearly a 70% decline in insurance. Nearly one-fourth cut in social assistance jobs. One-fifth loss in financial services employment. Again, a changing structure of establishments and employment. So. Finally, moving toward the future, in a post-COVID world, if Reading can continue to attract new firms in the computer field, in architecture and engineering, in the arts and healthcare, as it has since 2013, Reading has a bright future. So what are the things to think about? Continue to update your comprehensive economic development plan, 
continue to pay attention to the timeliness of the zoning process, work with the business community to market Reading as a good place to live and a good place to work. Thank you. So I hope that gives you a little bit of thought. I was thrilled to be able to come back uh, to take a look at Reading again, seven years later, uh, and see how it's changed uh, and how it's moving into the future. I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, I just wanted to now introduce our first, first panelist speaker, Jeremy Serier. And we, again, will have an opportunity to ask questions of Barry and our other speakers as well tonight in our question and answer uh, and the panelist discussion portion of the evening, which will be again shortly. Um, right, so back to Jeremy Serier. Jeremy Serier is the CEO and founder of Mansard, which is a commercial real estate and brokerage firm. Over the last 19 years, he has become an expert in commercial real estate sales in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, negotiating the sale of more than 1,000 properties for his clients. He has served as the president and senior instructor at the Certified Commercial Investment Member, CCIM Institute, in commercial real estate finance and market analysis. He will be parting with us a little early this evening, so I just wanted to remind uh, attendees um, that we will be taking real estate questions in the question portion uh, of this evening first, um, followed by other, um, other topics this evening. So with that, thank you, Jeremy, for joining us this evening, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks, Aaron and Barry. That was an awesome, um, awesome opener, sort of bringing the history of Reading um, up to today. In fact, the, the time frame that you covered is pretty much the the length of time that I've been working as a commercial real estate broker in the Reading market, serving the business community there. So I've seen a lot of that transformation happen that you talked about in your, um, you know, your your economic, you know, analysis there of the town. So I'm hoping what what I can do here is to sort of carry that forward and, and bring us down into the the real estate market. And what I what I the big question I had. And is what what does the real estate market look like today in Reading um, in relationship to not just the commercial market, which is made up primarily of the office, industrial, retail, and flex market, but also uh, made up of you know apartment housing, single family housing, and condominium housing. So so what I did was really ask this question. I said, well, what's you know what's going on? Um, in the town in relation to the space side of things. And, and that's, that's sort of the, the first kind of easy thing to tackle because we have great supply side information. Um, but what is it that drives demand for space in Reading? And it, it's people. People equal demand for space. And, and so when people equal demand for space, people have all different types of needs and uses and uh, requirements for space. So, so what we wanted to do is to sit down and ask the question, well, how has the population in Reading been changing over the last several years, but in particular um, since March of 2020, when we hit the, the pandemic um, and it just really you know, shifted our entire focus. So this is, this is an infographic a lot of information here for the town of Reading. And what this is showing you is the last 10 years of historical population trends in the town. And what you'll see is there's been, since 2012, a growth in population in Reading. And the population today is, is projected to be somewhere around 26,365 people um, with about 9,700 households in the town. Now, what's interesting about this is when we break down the, the kind of comp, comp, composition of the town, um, the average household size is 2.68 persons. So it's not a full, you know, full three people living in a, a housing unit, but the average is about 2.68. And the reason why that's important to look at is because when people move into the town, they're forming a household. And we look at the household information as a core unit to measure against for identifying what population 
growth or contraction can look like in a market and how that correlates to demand for space. So let's take a look at what this, what this has done. Um, we went to the US government and took advantage of the Freedom of Information Act to ask the question, um, how many people have actually moved into Reading or out of Reading since March of 2020? Now, not an easy question to answer because it's such a, a, a tight focus. Um, so we, we researched this a little bit and what we're able to do is to get a hold of uh, an employee at the US, US Postal Service in Memphis, Tennessee, filled out some information and requested the last four years of in-migration and out-migration numbers for the town. And, and so basically what we found is that approximately 39% of the population growth in Reading, according to address change information with, with the Postal Service, has happened since March of 2020. And so the, the data behind that basically says that the, if you take the average household size, which is that 2.68 people per household, and we look at the number of net gain household changes. So what this means is you have people who move out and you have people who move in. And when you move out of Reading, you file an address change with the Postal Service. And when you move in, you file an address change with the Postal Service. Over the last four years, there's been a 643 net gain of household, okay, households added to the Postal Service data. And so what we did was we said, if you take that information and you assume that about every household that's coming in, if they're on, on average, how many more people are we seeing? You've seen 664 people move into Reading since March of 2020. Over the last four years, it was 1,723 approximately. So that, what that says is that about 39% of the growth in population has happened since March. So when we take that information, we ask the question, well, how does that impact the real estate market in Reading? The first thing we did was we zoomed out a little bit to look at what's happening in the greater Boston market. So the first, this first chart you see is a chart of what's happening as a forecast for the second quarter of 2021 for the retail market in the greater Boston area. And you'll see here on the chart, there's a big circle on 13. And that 13 represents the halfway point into a hyper supply phase of the market. What the hyper supply phase of the market says is that you're going to see rents in the market softening, okay? You're going to see vacancies increasing and you're going to see new, new construction projects are delivering into, into a softening market environment. This is a projection for what the retail market in the greater Boston area will look like in the second quarter of next year based off of current modeling using pandemic, uh, the pandemic impact on the space market. <clears throat> the apartment market is at the same position. The forecast is to be out at the 13 point on the market cycle uh, chart here. So we're looking at a hyper supply phase. This also says that the Boston area should be experiencing a softening of rents and an increase in vacancy in the apartment market. Now what's, what's cr sort of critical here is to, is to look at this in relationship to the urban suburban um, separation. Reading, Reading is, living in Reading is not the same as living in South Boston for example. So what we're seeing for rents in Boston, this is according to RealPage. They are a software company that tracks, uh, provides property management software to the apartment industry. They published this data within the last 10 days or so. And what they're seeing is that in-town Boston rents have contracted by 5.3%. So we're seeing um, in the urban portion of the market in the Boston area, a contraction for rental rates and housing, which says that those units are having to compete harder to attract tenants. But some of those tenants are moving to Reading if we 
follow the logic of the mailing address changes, some of those people are moving into, into town. The industrial market is really the most robust market we're seeing in the greater Boston area. This is uh, the chart showing that we're at a peak phase in the cycle. Um, this, is, this is typical of very low vacancy rate, rising rental rates um, with potential for new construction deliveries to be you know, in process or to be delivered. And so the industrial market is, is holding up um, is, is the mo I would say the, probably the most robust sector in the market right now. And then the office market. Okay, so the office market is out at phase 12. So it's just past the hyper supply point in the market. It's, it's going to, it's starting to soften. You're starting to see um, some softening in rents, softening in demand. Boston, downtown Boston has seen over a million square feet of sublease space hit the market since March of 2020. As a result of that, you're going to see um, you know, a lot of competition for, for tenants. And the big question becomes, what does office look like as we go process this virus and we manage this big shift in how people work, working from home, um, going into the city to work, or even working in, the, in suburban offices? So let's take a look at each property type and so what I did was I, I went into the um, MLS and I pulled out a year of, some year over year data to look at the single family market in Reading from 2019 year to, as of yesterday compared to uh, 2020 as of yesterday. So here's, here's what the chart shows us. Um, the single family market in, um, in Reading has seen a contraction in the average days to offer. So what that means is when you put your house on the market, how quickly are you getting an offer on the property? Um, what the MLS has reported is it's happen happening nine days faster than it was a year ago at this time. The average days to the property going under contract to be sold is happening 11 days faster than it was this time last year. And the average sale price for sold property has increased from $660,853 to $695,929. So that's a positive variance of $35,000 in single family housing prices. You're also seeing the average sale price as a percent of list price increasing where you're now seeing offers that are exceeding the uh, list price. And that's gone up by 1.37% uh, since this time last year. So just the, the supply side information on single family housing um, seems to be indicating that the, you know, this population demand for housing has definitely shown up in Reading. The condo market, not, not a huge change here uh, year over year. We're actually seeing a, you know, a slight variance where you know, average days depending is just it's three days off. The average day, days to, to be sold is about the same. The average sale price has gone up by $11,997. And the average price, okay, the sale price is pretty, pretty consistent. So it's only 0.84% um, higher this time now over the last year. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if the if if folks, because I don't I don't sell condos and houses, um, but the feedback I'm hearing from the developer market is that the condo projects are, are a little slower now, and it, it may have to do with people being somewhat adverse to living in, in density, uh, density housing versus the single family market, which has really been the choice product um, in the suburbs as uh, people have been you know, trying to get more space. So how about the multifamily market? All right, so what I did to keep the information really kind of boiled down to a simple, an easy metric was I took the total units of apartments in Reading and then I just took the population. So I didn't segment it out based on who owns and who rents. I just said for the number of units that you have for rent and the total population, what are you looking at on units per capita? So everything I did here was on per capita. Um, the market is, it's got a 6.1% vacancy rate that says that there's about, there are about 54 units available. Um, the market rent 
uh, per month is averaging $2,167 right now. So keep this in mind as we, as we go to the next slide because we just saw Boston is seeing a, a negative uh, rent uh, change by 5.4%. Now, if we, if we take the information that we got from the Postal Service and we estimate that populations increased by about 664 people since March, that would mean that there's an additional demand um, if they all rent, okay? Or no, actually, if they don't all rent, there's just additional demand for rental housing of 22 units. So what you should expect to see is that vacancy rate decline um, as those 22 households absorb those 54 units. So there, there's going to be, um, in my estimation, rent's going to stay static or appreciate slightly in Reading. And so the data um, that we pulled, this is from CoStar, is showing us that there is rent appreciation occurring. I just ran this um, this afternoon. So we've got a positive uh, rent growth of about 3.8% in Reading. So th this is, this is for us, it's, it's corroborating that um, there is an urban to suburban shift occurring. The, um, the population that's moving is driving demand for housing. It's definitely showing up. But the question now becomes, what is the, um, what's the commercial side of the market really gonna look like? So retail, similar information. In Reading, you have 53 square feet of retail uh, space per person in the town. And that market as of yesterday was 5.7% vacant. So technically vacant, which means there's about 79,800 square feet of available retail space in the entire town. Market rents averaging $25.09 per square foot. So with the population um, coming into town, what would that mean for retail demand? Well, it would tell us that that population would demand about 35,000 square feet of retail space. Now there's a big caveat here because retail is, you know, as you're reading in the news, is, is one of the hardest hit sectors in, in the market. And Barry, I think your information is really, really valuable for looking at the employment change, particularly in the industry sectors that are vulnerable to the pandemic, um, where we have a you know a shift in in demand for how people are actually accessing and using retail space. So I think I think this this on the surface says hey retail looks pretty good in Reading, but I, I think it's not going to quite play out this way as consumer behaviors are shifting more more rapidly to online consumption, um, distribution of product to the home to the doorstep. Um, and full service restaurants really suffering as a result of the inability to bring people inside to dine um, and with restaurant closures coming as rapidly as they are. So the challenge, I think in, in Reading for this, this sector is going to be figuring out how to repurpose spaces, keep them activated in order to keep the town center vibrant um, and active with you know really kind of keeping a sense of community is a you know the, the center is the is the, the real gravity for for the the town to gather around okay office so barry mentioned the office market in reading they've got you know got a nice collection of class a and class b spaces um, rents are competitive with the neighboring towns the average space per person uh, in town is actually 20 square feet so when we look at that with the vacancy rate for office and writing, 6% vacancy rate is very strong. Um, that tells you there's a lot of tenant demand for space. And $22.90 a square foot for rent. Okay, so on an average basis, that's, that's a pretty strong rent. My thesis um, here is I think the writing office market will recover more quickly than the Boston market will. And, and I say that because I think there's going to be a shift in office leasing strategy. And this could be an opportunity for Reading to get out ahead of that. And, and sort of what Barry was talking about, get out on top of that you know, economic development marketing messaging that you know, in the suburbs, particularly in a town like Reading, which has got this awesome infrastructure 
the 9395 interchange and the commuter rail station, they're just fantastic access points to the town. Um, you've got office space to offer that frankly, is renting for a third of what you would pay in downtown Boston. So there's a, there's a strong profit and loss story to tell uh, employers, number one, number two, with population demand shifting out to the suburbs like this, like we're seeing, um, it's going to make sense for employers to consider a hub and spoke leasing model where they may have a smaller urban office, but then create multiple suburban office presence locations so that their employees can still get out of the work from home, which it's really a live at work situation and get back into an environment where they can um, work with work with their associates. So I think, th I think there's an opportunity there. The other thing that factors into the office market is if you go back and this, this is a chart from um, MetLife, they, they can, they put this together and I, I took it out of one of their reports on the office market for the, during the pandemic, they, um, they looked back over the last, 30 or some odd years at the average space that an employee occupies. And as you'll see, going back to 1990, it was about 280 square feet per employee on average. And by 2019, that had dropped down to about 240 square feet. If you took this back to the 1970s, you would actually see this, it would be a lot, it'd be up around four or 500 square feet per employee. So what we've seen in the office market is an increasing densification of of office use. And the idea there is to become more and more efficient with the use of space to create more collaborative environments for people to work in. And that, that made a lot of sense until March of 2020 when the message became, we need to all be six feet together or six feet apart, however you want to look at it. And now we have this challenge of what's demand for office space going to be. My sense is that we are going to return to the office um, but when we return, return to the office, we're going to spread out more. And as a result of that, if you were to take a typical office demand metric like 240 square feet and even roll it back to a 280 square feet per employee number, um, that's, that same employee is demanding 40 extra square feet of space. So you could bring fewer people back to the office and still occupy the same amount of space. They're just spread out more. So I think we're going to see that show up and that may end up being a buffer um, in the office market that could keep the office market really, you know, pretty, pretty vibrant. And I think it's going to play well for the suburbs personally. Industrial space. Reading has really not a lot of industrial space and very limited industrial zoning. And, and as you saw in the, in the chart, the market cycle chart, it's like the best, asset class to be in right now, particularly with the shift in retail consumption. So one of the, another big opportunity for the town, and I don't know where, where you put it, but if you could create any zones that would allow for industrial development with your proximity to 93 and to 95 and the commuter rail station, look at, you know, Woburn's got a very strong base. Um, they've really taken advantage of that, that industrial product they have. Um, you have some of that and you could do some really powerful things with it. And, and one of the things you'll see is when you bring those types of uses in, um, these are jobs that are typically, you know, basic jobs. They're bringing dollars into the community without putting additional demand on local services. So there's an opportunity to, to drive more growth in particularly this, this class of property, which I know it's not really as popular um, a product type, but it's, it's one that really is a powerful tax revenue engine. It's a powerful job engine and it's a powerful engine for uh, bringing dollars in for circulation in the market. So that's, that's uh, my, um, my story. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I, I appreciate your invitation to come out tonight to share this and I'm going to hang out here for comments or questions uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. So thank you very much. And Aaron, it's back to you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to Julie Thurlow for her remarks.
I'll quickly introduce Julie. Uh, she is the president and CEO of Reading Cooperative Bank and president of RCB Charitable Foundation. Under her leadership, the Commonwealth Institute named Reading Cooperative Bank a top 100 women-led business for the past four years in Reading. She's also a proud member of the first cohort of Lawrence Leeds. Lawrence Leeds is a cross-sectoral leadership program that's focused on civic engagement and social responsibility taught by the Harvard Business School. And with that, thank you so much, Julie, for joining us this evening. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Erin. Um, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, the, um, and I suppose, I think I've always wanted to say the views here are my own, um, but they are views that are, um, are really banking perspective, um, just like Jeremy um, was talking about the, the real estate market, um, just to see how this pandemic is actually affecting the banking industry and, um, and its effect then on the community. Um, but one point I do want to make is that this really is a self induced recession. Um, it was a health emergency that became an economic emergency. And now, um, um, you know, we, we sit here, um, you know, wondering whether another, another, um, uh, another um, round of, um, of relief is going to be provided. Um, but uh, Massachusetts closed on St. Patrick's Day. Um, we at Reading Cooperative Bank reopened in July. Um, white collar workers and most of Reading is still working from home. You see that in our parking lots, right? Um, and um, one of the things I did want to share that the Federal Reserve and the FDIC have both been very clear um, with their financial institutions to let us know um, that they are doing everything that they can and they're going to give us the tools and the resources to make sure that this medical crisis that became an economic crisis does not become a banking crisis. Um, we all remember what that was like in Massachusetts in the, the 90s and in fact, um, that's when I actually came to Reading. Um, and um, that is one of their main, uh, main points that they um, are making with their financial institutions. And they are encouraging um, that all of their banks um, work with their customers as much as feasible. Um, and that's something that I think is reassuring um, from a community basis. Um, so we opened our branches in drive up um, only mo mode. Um, we actually provided um, forbearance, um, basically relief um, to anybody who paid, um, paid mortgages um, and loans to the bank um, to 23% of our loans. So you're talking about almost 25% of Reading Cooperative Bank's customers were experiencing some type of COVID related um, um, diminishment in their cash flow. 60% um, of that, um, interestingly, were commercial borrowers, um, just like Jeremy was pointing about, uh, about, about the difference between the residential um, real estate and the commercial real estate. Um, the consumers were not affected as much as, um, as commercial and self-employed borrowers. Um, during that period of time, we waived all late charges and overdraft fees. Um, and 10% um, of those same credits are actually remaining in distress at this time. So it just it gives you a sense of, of the impact of the crisis on our portfolio, um, which is you know, predominantly based in Reading. Um, I will say, um, and I do want to share that the PPP process, um, we ended up writing 600 loans in total. Um, the SBA response, and I know, um, you know the news will give you both sides of that story, um, but um, for the SBA to be able to stand up a national lending program within a matter of days, um, and using the banking system to do so um, was was pretty remarkable. Um, we wrote 280 loans the first um, go around and 300 afterwards, um, and the loans equaled two and a half times um, payroll for small businesses. Um, and um, we just ended up having um, a bank wide event, you know, just celebrating all the work that employees had done um, during the whole um, challenges that we were dealing with this this spring. And um, just the remarks that came when when people are literally saying to you, thank you for that, the, the loan funded in my checking account, you kept another small business open, or I can now pay my employees. Um, it's really powerful. Um, and emotionally, um, to really that you're sitting at your kitchen table, possibly in your pajamas at, you know, eight o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning, um, and you're actually writing a loan that's actually going to keep the doors of a business open um, is pretty powerful. Um, but there are challenges ahead. Unemployment is definitely a headwind. Um, and landlords are people too. I put that up there because um, I think um, um, the state has done the right thing and not allowing 
um, evictions, um, but we also need to recognize that landlords do have bills and they do have mouths to feed and they do have mortgages that they do have to pay. Um, and trying to balance all of these different needs within the economy are really a serious, um, serious um, challenge as far as the state is concerned. Um, there are sector by sector challenges that I'm going to point out in a couple seconds, but um, a, a self reflection um, is just the whole inequity of COVID and workloads. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we actually were writing loans um, until 10 o'clock at night um, on weekends. And the, the work didn't stop um, and other people were out of work. Um, when we think about our parents that are now coming to work um, during the day or working from home during the day, but they're responsible for teaching their kids at the same time. There's just a tremendous amount of stress in the system um, in how we work um, and where we are if you have any you know, medical malady um, that makes you um, even more concerned about being out, all of that affects consumer confidence um, and people's spending. If you're staying in your home, you're not spending the way that you normally would. And that's having a financial impact on, on the entire, entire world. Um, Jerome Powell, um, I actually um, sent over my deck this morning because he did speak yesterday. Um, and, um, and unlike the Fed normally speaking, he actually did include some very dramatic words when he talked about the burdens of the downturn not being evenly shared. Um, when you talk about communities of color, low wage workers that have to get up every day and go to work, um, they can't stay at home and work from home and teach their kids at the same time. Um, that just the impact on minorities and even women um, who are, um, are trying to balance double burdens. It's just, um, there are uh, significant challenges challenges that we're all dealing with right now. Um, and um, really the necessity for a second round of the CARES Act is, uh, we can't um, underscore the need for that. Um, but I will, and, and I say that because the stimulus really did work. When you actually look at um, the poverty rate, um, the poverty rate was on its way down. Um, and again, I said that the economy, uh, the economic troubles that we're in are self-induced, but they're, they're, they were pandemic induced. 14% um, of Americans have lost their job. The unemployment's greater than 19% at the peak. Um, and yet the poverty rate actually dropped during that period of time. So that actually helped families. The stimulus that came in for families um, and the additional $600 weekly in jobless benefits actually prevented other scars um, from actually happening in the economy. Um, but the recovery right now is being experienced differently. Um, if you do not have a college education, um, your reemployment opportunities are diminished significantly. Um, and those are not things, um, there's a high college graduation rate, there's um, a high wage rate as far as um, reading is concerned, but there are people in our community that, that do have lower wage jobs um, and recognizing that the financial impact of this pandemic is infecting different groups of people differently depending on their education, um, where they actually earn, um, and race and gender is something that we need to recognize. And it's um, sometimes it's easy to, uh, especially if we're working from home, um, to sit on top to our computer and not realizing that the, the harm and the hurt that's actually happening in the economy right now. Um, unemployment. Um, is more harshly experienced in tourism rich states and that includes Massachusetts. Um, but when you think about um, what Jeremy was talking about as far as the commercial real estate market, a lot of things that are happening in the cities right now are not going to be happening for a long period of time. Um, you're talking about service industries. I used to have, um, I used to wear a suit every single day. I used to have a bag of dry cleaning every two weeks that I would leave and it would get picked up and returned. I have um, sent three sweaters to be dry cleaned um, since we've actually stopped. Um, and um, when we think about the restaurants that won't be here, the ones that may have been struggling beforehand won't reopen, um, the hotels and the, the need for hotels and whether or not we will be traveling. And I think a lot of people presume that doctor's offices um, are, are rich organizations, but you need to remember that they're paying wages to people. And if, um, if no one's going to the doctor because they're afraid to leave their home, or if they're, um, or if they're not scheduling certain things, um, then those um, services and those visits aren't happening and people aren't getting paid. Hospitals that are focused on COVID aren't doing surgeries, so um, there's not billing for those. And retailers were already struggling um, with the Amazon and the online advent um, now are even struggling even more so because they have diminished amounts of, um, of 
of buyers that are allowed in their store and people that are willing to go into the store. Um, this is just from the Wall Street Journal, which talks about you know, what people are seeing as far as the impact of uh, the pandemic on small business, whether it be urban or suburban. Um, so in general, do you believe that small businesses are doing poorly? Yes, they do. Do you, do you actually know of a small business that's closed because of the pandemic? Yes, um, and, um, and just whether or not the small business market, it will take a while. Um, when we actually have restaurants that close, it takes a while before somebody's willing um, to take the risk. Um, entrepreneurial risk is significant and it, it has an impact on your household. Um, so anything that we can do to keep our businesses operating um, is something that we need to consider. And this is me editorializing here. If we love our downtown and we love our community businesses, we really need to support them with our dollars now more than ever, whether it's a bigger tip, whether it's a, um, that extra meal that you're gonna have for a leftover tomorrow and try to spend as much as you've been spending in the past um, at these businesses. Um, and that includes our nonprofits and the arts. If we want things to be open and available when we're on the other side of this, then we need to support those organizations now. Um, going back to the landlords are people, businesses are, are made up of people, and these people took a lot of risk to open their business, and every day that they're not open um, is, uh, is negative effect on their household finances. Um, and on the right-hand side here is just really all the the negative detriments to different types of business organizations um, as a result of the pandemic um, and back to some of the comments that Jeremy made where are people going to want to live I actually saw an article where people are moving to Boise Idaho I think Reading is a lot more attractive than Boise Idaho but I don't know I've never been to Boise um, but will we ever really um, be willing to commute again and if we're only going into the office two or three days a week, what does that actually mean when you do the, the math on that? That means you're only there you know, 40 or 60% of the time. That means you're not buying lunch at a local restaurant. You're not using the dry cleaner. You're not going to the gym. You're not using the businesses that surround that building. Um, and, um, and how long before those office buildings return to capacity? Um, I actually did go to um, everything but the dog and get a treat for the dog. Um, but he's completed that treat and now he decides that he wants to photo bomb. So hopefully I'll be able to get this finished without him being here. Um, so um, there really is a question about how long before office buildings in Boston return to capacity or will they ever? Um, there are recuperating amounts in, uh, of space available in the sublet market. Um, but you know, this is actually the first pandemic that the construction industry um, has not been, um, been harmed um, because usually contractors um, are the first um, the first folks that, that, that see the slowdown, but in this case, ho um, home office renovations are keeping them busy. Um, as far as commercial real estate owners, um, you know, as I was saying about the, uh, the capacity, um, if half of the Massachusetts workforce um, isn't expected to return to the office even after vacancy is a, um, the vaccine is available, what does that actually mean for businesses in the area? Um, tenants are already renegotiating um, the space um, and um, our landlords do tell us that um, that they are working with their um, with their tenants as much as they possibly can, um, especially the folks that have lost a household member to COVID or temporarily out of work. Um, but they do also have people that are taking advantage and every time um, the landlord doesn't get paid, that is their personal wealth that is actually disappearing. Um, so going back to my earlier comment that um, the um, pandemic has had at that and this downturn is really unequal as far as how it's being experienced by people. Um, these are the projected default rates based on um, the type of industry or the type of commercial real estate that's out there, obviously. Um, lodging, hotels, retail, um, and other um, are um, expected to take the biggest hit um, of all. Um, so from a banking standpoint, where do we see things? Um, you know, the PPP loans um, did generate loan volume for us um, since consumers are not borrowing the same way they were or commercial borrowers are not. Um, we also have had a huge influx of deposits, over 70 million in deposits that have run in our doors. Um, people just seeking safety, a safe place to put their money. Um, and um, the Federal Reserve does indicate that interest rates will remain low for some time. Um, so we will, as banks, be earnings challenged. We make money on the interest rate margin. It's just not going to be there. Um, rates are zero bound. 
um, tremendous amount of refinancing. So there's a lot of activity, but there's not a lot of earnings tied to that activity. Um, and so you will likely see a lot of acceleration in mergers and acquisitions in the banking environment, um, growth needed to offset the declines in margins. Um, and I just did want to um, make a mention that the um, Financial Accounting Board did make um, adjustments to the rules for how we actually provide relief to our borrowers, both commercial and consumer, um, which should avoid the failures that you ended up seeing. I think a lot of the activity that was taken by both the federal government and by the agencies um, and just a proactivity that actually occurred as soon as the downturn happened um, has really avoided a lot of the financial harm that we were so concerned about right um, when we shut our doors. Um, as far as consumers are concerned, refinance if you can. Unfortunately, if you've had changed financial circumstances, you will be unable to do so. Um, I will warn you, appraisals are taking 45 days. Um, going back to the inequity of workloads, right? Uh, if you're a mortgage originator, you are busy. Um, major employers are reevaluating their workforce as PPP expires and a second round of funding is actually frozen in Congress. Um, but home appreciation is strong, which that does have an influence on consumer confidence. Um, so um, hopefully that will force, forestall a lot. Um, and the only thing that I can say again to consumers that may be on um, and, and watching is if you are having financial difficulty, if you've had some financial um, challenge that's arisen due to COVID, make sure you communicate early and often with your financial institution. Um, and, um, and again, back to, back to Jerome, he says it best at, at, at all as, um, you know, there's um, more stimulus is needed and the sooner the better. Um, he used the word tragic when he actually referred to the need for policy intervention. Um, and in fact, his argument is um, we need more and um, anybody who says we don't want to overdo it, um, it would be much better to overdo it and have to pull back um, than for any of the harm that could actually happen to households um, without it. Um, so thank you for your time and listening. I hope that was of value to you and I look forward to hearing more from my colleagues. Julie, thank you so much for your remarks this evening and thank you to all of our speakers this evening. Um, with that, I'd uh, like to open it up to the question and answer session. Um, I want to also recognize that Jeremy um, needs to leave us quite soon. Um, and we do have a quick question from our town manager, Bob Lusher, um, who will be, he will be, um, his screen and video will be shared um, with all of you while he's asking his uh, real estate question and then Jeremy will part ways with you and we'll continue on our question and answers um, okay. and I will again um, help participants participate um, once we wrap up with this initial question and thank you all again. Thanks Erin. I'm gonna put Bob on. Bob you can ask your question. I just wanted to say that we also have another question that Jeremy's at, answered in the question and answer but we'll, we'll re take that out loud as well. Thank you Bob. Okay thank you. Um, there's a lot to think about from the three speakers, but one of the things I was weaving uh, through all of your talks is earlier I mentioned how we export workers and clearly we're not exporting as many workers as we used to, uh, primarily office workers. Um, you know, pandemic uh, health risks aside, um, does, do the speakers see this as a trend in the work culture to be working more at home? And sure, we could offer uh, some, you know, we could market our office space, but couldn't we also uh, market our businesses to the folks who normally leave Reading during the week to work and suddenly they're home? So, so Bob, when you say, <clears throat> um, I got the first part, which is working at home and that trend, but you also mentioned marketing businesses to people who are, who've been leaving Reading? Our, our workers are now going to be home more than they used to be. Yep. They won't be shopping near where they used to work. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they shop now in downtown Reading? Well, that's that's okay. So that's a good point because Julie, you talked a lot about the circular flow of income through your talk, which is great because it's the idea of where where that um, where the money's being spent, when and why. And when you bring that money back into the household, uh, people are making different decisions about how they're consuming. <clears throat> the challenge. The challenge may be getting people to come out of the house and form habit form habits in the town center, and and maybe that's something the town can 
work with the business community to message message people in town that, that look, you know, you, if you're not at work, you're not buying lunch and um, ordering your dry cleaning to be done and going to the gym while you're at the office and the financial district or seaport district, wherever you go to work. Uh, here are some strategies of how we can embolden that population to support the local local business. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it, you know, local's always been a cliche, but there's actually an opportunity to redefine what local really is right now. And I think, Bob, that's what, sort of what you're getting after. How do we do that as a town? How do we engage, engage the residents to put some of that money into circulation? I, I think there's definitely an opportunity there. The, the question on the office piece, the, just, like, just like this has shifted um, brick and mortar retail more rapidly to e-commerce consumption, which was happening, but it just, it was an accelerant. This has also done that to the office market. But I think the office market, I think it comes back. Um, it won't be exactly what it was. I think people are gonna be, it's people, you're gonna have fewer employees in larger spaces. But at the end of the day, I think what we're gonna, what we're gonna get down to is, <clears throat> there's a lot of productivity that gets done in the office. And as a guy, who's fortunate enough to have an office 1.3 miles from his house, who has four kids, nine and under, I wasn't getting any work done at home in March. And I, I, I came to the office about a week into this thing and I was the only one here working. And it's the only way I could get deep work done. So I, I, I just, I know it works and it's gonna play out. The larger the organization, the more challenging it's gonna be. The smaller companies can come back to work in the office faster because you just have fewer people to manage. You have fewer COVID issues to overcome. When you get a large organization, one person comes in, 15 people get sick, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And I've actually heard some speculation around whether or not um, office space in the communities in suburbia will become more attractive um, for businesses to relocate to. Um, and I love the idea of actually marketing local businesses to um, consumers in our town so that they actually become um, the hub um, that they can be. Um, but I think, um, you know, there is, there is the challenge of businesses being comfortable bringing people back to the office. And I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, there's just like the, the difference in, in experiencing um, COVID um, for consumers and for employees, it's the same way for leaders of businesses and whether or not they're comfortable, whether or not they have capacity. We happened to um, move to Walkersbrook um, so that we had um, control of our future and Jeremy helped us and we have excess capacity and that's why we were able to bring everybody back um, and um, and establish social distancing requirements and, and cleanliness requirements so that we're able to work um, in, in a space and separate at the same time. Um, but not everybody is going to be able to do that. But I think you know, over the next 12 months, we'll have a better picture of what that actually could look like. But it is an opportunity um, to revitalize um, our local communities and have people live, work, and, and stay and play right here. We have a... Um, oh, go ahead, Barry. I'd like to just add uh, to what Jeremy was talking about. Uh, the statistics that I um, presented earlier showed, and I, I think Jeremy would agree with this, that retail trade was already declining well before COVID, and uh, it's just accelerated it. I remember doing a book uh, way back in 1979. I, book, I, I wrote a book called The Retail Revolution. It was part of a major study at MIT, Harvard, and Boston College where I was teaching. And in it, we were talking back in 1979 about the decline of the old fashioned downtown uh, uh, department store, the, the Macy's in New York, the Hudson's in Detroit where I grew up um, and so forth. And it was being replaced by two things. One, the expansion of uh, the discount department store, the Target, the Walmart, the Kmart, um, and boutique little um, I think that is now seeing a second retail revolution. Uh, I know that even before COVID, I was spending more of my time purchasing stuff on Amazon or other e-commerce uh, e sites simply because it was 
quicker and more efficient for me to do this given my busy schedule than to grab my car and go down to the you know, store and, and see this stuff. I think that's going to continue. Uh, so that retail trade is probably not going to be a major factor in terms of the economic development growth of perhaps any community. Um, you may see around, you know, retail trade if you, if you have an Amazon, you know, warehouse in your town. But otherwise, I think we have to think about, you know, what are the new industries that are going to be the critical ones for expanding our economic development base? Thank you, Barry. Uh, we do have a quick question in the um, in the chat, and I just wanted to be have it answered live. That um, Reading has looked into co-working spaces. Is there any analysis on using co-working spaces as satellite offices instead of companies leasing their own separate satellite offices? Um, I'm wondering, Jeremy, if you're still with us, if you can expand on that. Jean, I think well, Jeremy is part of. The I, I can. I'll yeah. answer that one, and then I've got to oh. go. <clears throat> okay. Um, so there's, that's, that's actually a strategy that we're recommending right now to office landlords that have had, frankly, no office activity in the last six months to seven months on their properties is consider taking the spaces that have private offices and breaking them down and making them co-working flexible office environments. Because at this point, there's, we, you know, we're, we're, and we're, we're sort of changing on a feels like maybe every two weeks we're changing right now in terms of what's happening to us. March was every day. So the pace of change is so, so short sighted that it's hard to make long term decisions about your business and your space needs, particularly if you're, you know, you're running a company um, making a long term commitment based on the data you have right now because there's so much data coming in so quickly and it's changing so fast. So there is an opportunity in that space to offer flexible co-working situations. There are a lot of people, as I said, at home that just need to go somewhere. <laughs> they just need to go somewhere and do to do their work. And so I, I do see that as an opportunity in the market. All right, thank you. Uh, we have an attendee, Bruce, Bruce Rosenberg, who has got his hand up to ask a question. Uh, Bruce, if you'd like, you are welcome to ask your question at this time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to, uh, to Barry, Julie, Jeremy. Um, I have a question and is based upon uh, Dr. Bluestone's, I guess it was his number one critical factor in terms of ED marketing. And the question is actually directed at Aaron, uh, Bob Lelacher, and Mark Doxer. So first, let me back this up. I am the chair of the Town of Westford Economic Development Committee. Um, it has three ex officio members from the town. The rest of us are uh, all volunteer residents. And so I'm gonna ask a little bit of first, before I get to the real question, um, I'd like to know how long has it been since Reading has an economic development director, that's you, Aaron. So can you answer me that first? Sure, the town of Reading has had uh, a couple of economic development directors over the last several years. Um, I'm the second economic development director and I have been with the town for about a year and a half now. Okay, so my, my real question is, with which I think I know the answer, and again, it's related to uh, Dr. Bluestone's number one critical factor of ED marketing. Can you, Bob, Mark, t talk a little bit about the, the gradient, the delta between before having an ED director and after an ED director in terms of the changes and the growth in the town of, of Reading? All right, that's a great question, Bob. Why don't you start? Yeah, Bruce, um, I, I remember with our prior economic development director, we had a nice uh, chat in Westford, um, as probably would have been 2016. Um, you, you know, to give, to give you the, an answer to the question you didn't ask, uh, it's all about relationships and putting yourself on the map. Um, and that's what our two economic de development directors have done the best. 
Um, we've had commercial developers that work very close to Reading and drive through Reading every day, not be aware of some of the development opportunities until you know, a dedicated staff person could say, look, come visit with me this afternoon and I'm gonna take you on a tour, for instance, of Walker's work down where Julie is. And um, you know, a, a significant developer had no idea there was, uh, there was opportunity down there. So it's really putting yourself on the map and, and giving yourself um, you know, a name, I guess a reputation to some degree. And then um, you know, we, we've done a town meeting past some, uh, some zoning changes uh, going back three or four years and our downtown is gangbusters in terms of development. Um, it's mixed use. We'll see how well the commercial uh, stuff does, but you know, certainly the housing is attractive. Um, this is the busiest Reading has been um, in, that I've ever known in terms of commercial development, absent some big projects maybe on the outskirts of town. So I think when you look at Reading in two years from now, the, the data is going to show a, a difference. Today, maybe not so much. Maybe just to, to add on to that, Bob, you did a great job answering that, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I kind of view it that there, there are kind of three chunks we're looking at. There are the existing businesses, and obviously supporting them is very important, and there are some initiatives taking place now to, to help and, and engage with them. Level two is, as Bob mentioned, the new inventory that's just coming online. Uh, a lot of it coming from the mixed use activities. And how do we, what can we do to, to get um, good people to come into those spaces. Obviously quite the challenge in COVID-19. And then the third tier really is what are the new kind of bigger opportunities? Are there any that are out there? Um, we don't have a, a, you know, a lot of, of brand new large open space that's available, um, although there may be some, some possibilities. And, and there are a couple of development activities that Erin is um, leading the charge on in terms of taking a look at what those might be, how, I, how might we develop them um, and take them forward from there. So I think there's a lot of stuff um, happening now. And as Bob said, we'll kind of, we'll monitor it and hopefully COVID will at some point be a little bit friendlier to, to all these activities. Thank you, Mark. Our next question is from Lisa Egan. Um, she asks in the question and answer section, thank you to all the knowledgeable and interesting speakers. Do, any, do you have any suggestions on what the chamber can do to better support writing businesses than the writing business community? I appreciate the shout out to our local downtown shops and restaurants. Lisa Egan is from the Chamber of Commerce. So that is for our panelists. Julie, you wanna step in on that one? Um, sure. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, first of all, here's hoping there's more stimulus available and there's already conversation about a second round of PPP. Um, so any way that the chamber can help get get word and, and news and information out um, to businesses as far as that's concerned. Um, I like what, um, what has been raised here already is how do we actually promote um, our businesses to people that are now working from home um, and um, making sure that they know what is actually open. Is there a mechanism um, so that we can actually have levels of announcements to um, consumers in our marketplace to let them know what businesses are open, how they're open, um, rather than each individual business only reaching out to what it has in its database of email addresses. Um, it's just a thought there. All right, thank you. Um, all right, I don't have any other questions. I would prompt our, atten oh yes, we, we just got another one. Thank you, and I'll let attendees, if you use the uh, raise hand feature on your screen, um, I can see that and then I can, uh, unmute your microphones. Uh, this one's also from Carl Dietrich. Is there any analysis on improving cycling and walking infrastructure and shuttles uh, can help enable more development of offices, shops, apartments while controlling traffic since bikes, walking, and shuttle riding would take some cars off the streets? Um, I don't know who might want to jump in on that question. Maybe Jean or Julie, if you have some thoughts there. I know we have a long conversation going on in the community right now. Sure, I'll jump in. Hi, I'm Jean Delios. I'm the assistant town manager and um, I'll uh, give a plug for planning and the planning side of the house. Um, we, we work very, very closely as a team in uh, town hall and um, lots of the work that you're seeing now is being done across departments. So we work a lot with police, we work a lot with fire, we work um, collaboratively and I think that's a, a strong element of the path forward. 
Um, so what the point that I would like to make is that when we rezoned the downtown uh, in 2009 and we made it a downtown smart growth district and then expanded that zoning a few years later, four or five years later, um, we decided that um, development and growth in the downtown was something the community was very supportive of. In fact, they were so supportive of it, it was identified in our economic development plan which Professor Bluestone um, flagged for us when we had the EDSAT, and we actually did an economic development plan, and we're talking about the next generation of that, so I was glad to hear that the planning effort is, uh, is flagged as important. But uh, my point is creating walkable communities, walkable downtowns, putting housing, and there's nothing radically new about this. We, in planning circles, we call it smart growth, new urbanism. Um, these are terms that um, are, are current, but there's nothing new about it. Having walkable communities, putting housing in the downtown, putting uh, businesses aligned with where the, the people live is, is, is an old story, but one that we have really embraced in Reading and with new residents moving in and hopefully new businesses opening on the horizon, it's a win-win for everybody. And um, at the same time, you, Jane and Aaron and I and many others have been part of a working group looking at um, the major um, state highway through the town route 28 and how can we better design that um, the road diet which I know nobody likes that name I'm not a fan of it uh, but the the realignment I'll call it of the major spine of the uh, state highway that runs through the center of town looking at that in creative ways and finding opportunities to have multimodal transportation is, uh, is a big project that we've been working on. And it is a trial road diet. I keep hearing people saying, oh, the road diet this, the road diet that. It's a trial road diet. So we are trying it to see if it could work. And I'm very excited about that and uh, very, very happy that Reading is willing to try some new things. And that's, I think, uh, something that I'd like to leave with the group is um, we don't always succeed when we try new things, and sometimes there are pain points, but without trying, we're never going to get there. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. All right. I don't have any other questions at this moment. Erin, um, we're going to throw it back to you for a wrap. Excellent. Well, thank you all to our speakers this evening. Uh, and I also wanted to thank um, our select board members, uh, Mark and uh, Mark Doxer and Landry and Vanessa Alvarado for joining us as well. Um, we're ending a little early, but that's okay because there's a lot of other activities happening this evening um, in town and uh, nationally with our debate this evening. So again, uh, thank you all so much for coming and attending and I'm happy uh, to be available for any follow-up questions uh, from any attendees. My email address is eshafer at ci.reading.ma.us. And you can also find all that information online at the Town of Reading website as well. Thanks again and good evening.